Okay. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Great. Uh, warmly welcome to this event with Pascal Sunkara. And this seminar will be held in English. And uh, after Pascal has talked about his book, The Socialist Manifesto, there will be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions to the author. Well, not everyone can ask questions because uh, the time we have at our disposal is, of course, limited. But each one of you have a theoretical opportunity to do so anyway. Uh, my name is Lisa Alquist, and I am, among other things, a member of the Left Party's program committee. But above all, I am a member of the local party association Vänsterpartiet Kortedala Gamle Staden Bergsjön, which is currently reading the Socialist Manifesto as a study circle. Uh, conveniently, I received a few questions from participants, so I thought I could ask them to Bhaskar after your speech. Yeah. I will now shortly introduce the author, and the book he is going to talk about, and then let him talk with his own own words. Bhaskar Sunkara is the founding editor and publisher of Jacobin magazine, the largest socialist magazine in the English language. He is a national surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign, a former vice chair of the Democratic Socialist of America, as well as the author of The Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an Era of Extreme Inequality, which has been recently translated into Swedish. In this book, Pascal Sunkara shot the history of socialism from Marx to the present day. Every would-be socialist, he argues, and anyone interested in socialist ideas, even if only to know how the other side thinks, needs to engage with the many threads of this story. Often maligned as utopians with eyes only on the future, socialists in fact have, from the beginning, been students of history. Today's socialists must follow in the same tradition. In the second part of the book, Pascal Sunkara discusses the world today and why there are new opportunities for this better sort of socialism to take root. As we'll see, Britain's Jeremy Corbyn and the United States' Bernie Sanders have pursued a class struggle social democracy unleashing popular energy that has revitalized the left as a whole. Pascal Sankara offers a tentative strategy for taking ad advantage of this unexpected second chance and explain why the working class can still be an agent of social transformation. And don't forget, the book uh, you can uh, buy it outside after this speech, do that. So, please welcome Bhaskar Sunkara. Um, thank, thank, you all for, um, thank you all for coming. I actually just uh, landed. I landed here at 11.02, uh, so about a little bit over an hour ago, and I last went to sleep Thursday night. So if this goes very poorly, what I would ask you fine comrades is to just not tell anyone about this. Um, just pretend it never happened, go about your day, have a nice lunch, um, and so on. So I assume given that, that most of you, I would imagine, are uh, cadre, are activists in a um, left political party, that it wouldn't make sense for me to either focus on the one moral and ethical case to build a world without exploitation and oppression, because I would, I would imagine that we all are on the same page about that, or to dwell too much on the history of different parts of the 
the socialist um, tradition, from our qualified successes to our um, dismal failures to um, you know this this overarching history that that um, that forms a, a good chunk of my my book. So what instead I want to do is focus on um, a few maybe relevant updates and things about uh, what's going on in the uh, United States with the Bernie Sanders campaign and how to contextualize it as a um, phenomenon of the left and to a lesser degree uh, do the same for Corbyn and draw a few overarching um, conclusions. And the chief among them will be that we could say that the key um, demands being put forward by uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, by Bernie Sanders, are fundamentally social democratic demands, but they're demands that would be completely anathema to what has become um, uh, the demands of social democratic parties and, and what has become uh, social democracy. So I would say, in other words, that these are demands that open up the road to more radical forms of polarization and politicization uh, rather than forecloses uh, them. So that's, that's the overarching um, uh, thesis, and that's, again, also what I try to do in the, the book, which is try to reintegrate um, this immediate program of what I call class struggle social dem democracy in the socialist tradition and to essentially restore the idea that, that even though Socialist, uh, social democracy's contradictions are, are insurmountable in a way. Uh, the reliance, in other way, w words, of um, social democratic states on having profitable firms to tax, the fact that it might embolden workers and give them more power and more, more say in their, their workplaces and better wages, but fundamentally it cannot, by, by its nature, take away um, power from um, uh, the, the, the power the capitalists have to withhold investment. So in other words, um, that contradiction, I'm not arguing, is, um, uh, can go away. But if we were to go back to, let's say, the criticism that any communist or, or a, a, a radical socialist would have of social democratic parties in the 1960s and, and 70s and so on, uh, that fundamental, contradict, uh, fundamental argument, the, the core of it, uh, has in fact been resolved uh, by um, Corbyn and, and, and Sanders by the nature of how they're doing uh, politics in this context. So I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say you were a, a British far left, uh, let's say a Trotskyist activist in the 60s and 70s. What would be your core criticism of the weak form of social democracy, um, but any form of social democracy, but the particularly weak form of social democracy practiced by the UK Labour Party? Well, you would argue or point out that one, the social democracy of the UK Labour Party was one that was fundamentally tied to an alliance with the United States and foreign policy, that the UK Labour Party was perhaps even the most giddy uh, junior partner of, of US imperialism, and so on. So you have that, that criticism of social democracy in this form being a part of the um, uh, US imperialist kind of world, world order. The second thing you would say is that, that the Labor Party is taking working class energy and militancy on the shop floor, and it's directing it towards narrow electoral ends and it's directing it towards uh, the buttressing of a relatively conservative trade union bureaucracy. So tied to that would be the idea that, well, fundamentally, even though these parties were created to represent the interests of a oppressed class, in essence, the social compromise, the, so the corporatist compromise that was created by these, these parties during their years in power, ended up only just marginally improving the standards of living, but maintaining kind of uh, the, the fundamental oppression at the core of the capitalist system. So my argument that Sanders and Corbyn represent something radically different 
isn't about what they're particularly demanding. If you just look at it in, in a narrow programmatic sense, then of course the particular demands of Sanders and Corbyn are even more moderate than the demands of um, early 1980s social democracy in France and Greece. If you look at the initial Mitterrand program or the program of uh, Pasok in, um, in Greece, you know, on paper these are more radical demands. But the two fundamental criticisms the left had of, of social democracy in the 60s and 70s have been re uh, resolved if you think about the fact that, well, is Jeremy Corbyn buttressing a US-led imperial project? Well, ask British paratroopers. I don't know if you remember this from two months ago, where there was a famous well-circulated video where British paratroopers um, were using as target practice Jeremy Corbyn's face. Um, there's lots of talk in the British media from time to time about British generals and leading figures in MI5 saying that you know, they just wouldn't be able to accept a, a Jeremy Corbyn um, a prime minister um, uh, prime ministership. With Sanders' record is a bit more um, spotty, but this is the only U.S. Uh, politician who has foregrounded uh, the uh, demands for self-determination, uh, for, for liberation of Palestinians, who spoke out about U.S. foreign policy, who spent much of his time as a mayor in the 80s uh, doing solidarity work in Central America, who supported openly uh, the Sandinistas, who's talked about the Cuban achievements in healthcare and education and so on, and continues to um, do these things, which is, by the standards of U.S. Uh, politics, you know, basically suicidal. The second major criticism is just should be rapidly apparent to anyone who's paid attention to the political context, and not just the US, UK, but across much of the advanced capitalist world. In a period of deep depoliticization, deep malaise, Sanders and Corbyn have created a rhetoric that, that has created a polarization. And the message of that rhetoric is very simple. And the message says, it's not your fault. If you're suffering from unemployment, if you're suffering from all these things that we've been told to see as individualized failings, this in fact is not your fault. These are social problems with collective solutions. But it's not just a, uh, a economic problem or a collective solution in a cross-class way. The common Sanders rhetorical feint is to say that in fact, the reason why you're in this poor situation is because of certain individuals. But these individuals aren't racialized minorities, they're not immigrants, they're millionaires and billionaires, and they're profiting off your weakness and your conditions. This is fundamentally a rhetoric of polarization, and not polarization in a wishy-washy kind of uh, populistic you know, way, uh, but polarization in, in a way that is instantly recognizable as the classic uh, Marxist uh, analysis of, uh, of history, of society, and its resolution is, of course, banding together working people to, uh, to fight a political revolution against those millionaires and billionaires. That's not a rhetoric that takes working class energy and directs it towards narrow electoral end. That's a rhetoric that's using an electoral campaign in a period of deep defeat to re-energize civil society. So if you were to ask me five years ago, what is the path for socialists to, to build? I would have given you an answer that I still believe in the abstract, which is the classic strategy of the left for you know, the first uh, 160, 170 years of the modern left, which is that elections are primarily um, litmus tests, uh, barometers. Uh, they tell us uh, of what the level of class struggle and class organization and class consciousness is. So we would organize in our workplaces, we organize in our communities, we slowly build up power, uh, then the election shows us how well we're doing. It's a, it's a test in that, in, that, in that measure. And primarily, we slowly pursue this, this strategy of patience to build up power in civil society, and you know, when we win elections, that's a, that's a good thing, but we would need such immense power and such immense control in, in, uh, in class organization to actually be able to carry out our program. There'd be no point in focusing on just little shortcuts to win uh, elections if it meant that you didn't have the class power to actually carry out your program. 
Now, what I think is happening in the United States and the United Kingdom is we will still need to do the same thing. We'll still need to build the same level of class struggle and class uh, organization at the grassroots level. But we are using the spark of an electoral campaign to repoliticize what was completely uh, dormant. In the US especially, it's rather incredible to think that in the most advanced, um, most wealthy, uh, capitalist democracy um, in, in world history, you could have a, a, a democracy that, that is, in fact, a real democracy as far as civil liberties and, and so on. Despite all the injustices, I think we should take pride in the victories that have been won. And just like in, in Sweden and the United States, it was the working class um, who fought for, for these, these, um, these liberties and extensions of suffrage and so on. It w wasn't just gifts from the elites. But we've had this democracy without representation for the majority class with basically two capitalist parties to choose from. We never even had the pleasure of having a social democratic party uh, or labor-based party to betray us, like in Sweden or the UK, because you know, we, never, we never managed to build one you know, in, the, in the first place. So in this context, I think we need to take stock of this opportunity and take stock of the fact that in extremely depoliticized societies, Elections are the only way that people are still engaging with politics. And even that, many of them are not turning out. But that's still the only time when it's an opportunity when we can knock on doors, when we can talk to people about politics. We're not talking about socialism in the abstract. We're talking about these candidates, what they stand for, who, who, what kind of uh, things we're trying to fight for. Um, so in the United States, our main galvanizing demand now is for Medicare for all, a single payer health insurance system, which again sounds like a, a modest, moderate demand that even maybe Christian democracy um, would have been for in most parts of Europe um, 40, 50, 50 years ago. Um, today, the demand for a single payer health insurance system as an alternative to a, a radical working class achievement like the National Health Service in the UK is something that the, you know, um, certain parts of the conservative party in the UK uh, want. So it sounds like a moderate demand, but in effect what it would mean is the effective socialization or socialization of a large part of you know, one fifth of the, of the economy in the, in the US. It would be the biggest expropriation of, of wealth from private actors, private insurance actors to turning it into a public good uh, since the uh, Civil War, uh, which led to the to the uh, end, of, end of slavery and the liberation of you know, people who were considered just, just, um, just property in the, in the past. So these are our radical demands and will encounter a lot of um, resistance. But, so I think in other words, this is our moment to use elections and to use this shortcut, not to say that we could just have this one galvanizing moment where we win an election and then we are able to use the machinery of state to accomplish our program, but to say that this could be the starting point for the kind of struggle and organization civil society that can actually carry out a program. And one way to look at it would be to think about how the old French uh, socialist, uh, the first um, socialist uh, prime minister of France, they, they, had, they had prime ministers back then, yeah, prime minister of France in the 1930s, um, now they have presents. Uh, see, these are the kind of tan tangents of getting on because of my sleep deprivation. Uh, but Leon Blum uh, was a socialist. Uh, so he was part of the, you know, the right wing split at the Congress of Tours in 1920s. But even back then, the Socialist Party, or the French section of the Workers International, was quite, uh, quite left wing. And he was very much a Marxist, and he thought about how to accomplish the program uh, of, of his party in very traditionally Marxist terms. So he had two concepts at first. One is, of course, the goal of socialism is what? The conquest of power. So that was the, um, the goal, which is winning power and expropriating the capitalist class and installing some sort of mass um, industrial democracy, some sort of um, 
some sort of big, broadly socialist society. And the, the contours of exactly how this was going to be done, they weren't really sure about. There was some efforts at creating commissions on nationalization to figure out what could work, what couldn't. Um, but this was the, the goal. Then they had another conception. Well, what happens if we're taking power but we can't do a full expropriation, if we can't really achieve our, our final goal of, of, of socialism? Well, he conceptualized that as the exercise of power. Well, taking power to um, just merely, or not merely, but to um, create the conditions in which one can more easily conquer power in the future. So one way to look at this would be kind of non-reformist reforms or structural reforms or things like that, which not only improve the lives of working people in the here and now, but also put them in a better position to fight back. Now, by the time the 30s came around, he had to come up with a new conception, a new justification for taking power, which was just the occupation of power. And essentially, in this rather pessimistic formation, it was the fascists and the far right are going to take power unless we do. And we might not be able to do anything if we take power, but at least if we occupy power, we could prevent the far right from doing things that will make it even harder in the future or impossible in the future to exercise or conquer power. And, and Blum knew this very much firsthand. So about one, two months before he took power in 1936, uh, he was not only uh, uh, France's first socialist prime minister, he was the first Jewish prime minister of, of France. And he was dragged, he was uh, grabbed in the streets, tied to the back of a car, beaten up, and, 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 and almost, almost to the point of, uh, uh, of death. Uh, so he knew very much the, the threats, this is in Paris, he knew very much the, the, the threat um, that, was, that was looming in, in Europe. But when the popular government came to power with very moderate demands, with this kind of mentality of just preventing the, the far right from taking power, with the communists under pressure from the common turn, a moderating their lines and not taking kind of minister positions that Blum was willing to give them, with, with Blum himself thinking that he wouldn't be able to um, accomplish much, uh, what happened was there was a mass upsurge of working class people that went on strike for two months, that uh, did lockouts, that did all sorts of radical uh, things that created a condition in which French capitalists were forced to go to this socialist government they hated and says, you need a, uh, help to bring, a, bring a, you know, production uh, back, to um, organize some sort of truce. And that led to, of course, really extensive reforms. Uh, the first summer holidays, um, for workers and so on. So what I'm saying is that if we take power in such a way that we let our base, that let this re-energize, re-politicize people who have further demands uh, push the limits of what's possible, then obviously we have more room for our state actors. I'm not saying that we have uh, socialism in our sights as something we can immediately uh, accomplish, but I am saying that the scope for reforms in every country is broader than we think, especially if we don't counterpose this idea of extra parliamentary and parliamentary um, movements. Of course, you could be like Syriza and occupy power, not be able to accomplish much, and when there is grassroots energy, uh, not choose to, um, to embrace it and embrace likely defeat. And we could talk about why Syriza took their path and, it's, it's, it's one that I think we can't judge on just moralistic uh, terms. So fundamentally, I think this is an era where in the United States, we are uh, starting relatively close to scratch, but we know that our core program has majoritarian support. So even on the issues of immigration, for instance, more Americans today, even after years of Trump's xenophobic um, rantings have more favorable views of immigrants, dramatically more favorable views, um, than they did in uh, 1994 in the Clinton administration. Um, more Americans, a majority of Americans, think that immigrants contribute more to the economy than they, than they take away. A majority of Americans support 
Medicare for All, support socialized medicine. Uh, there's majority support for a jobs guarantee, for all these other things in our demands. In is isolation on all these policy issues, we have support. With Sanders, we've been able to take these um, policy preferences, which do skew left to center, but take it and combine it into a narrative that can galvanize people. What we're doing so in the context where we don't have a party, where we don't have um, organization, where we have a weak and defeated labor movement, uh, a lot of us in the Democratic Social of America then are trying to be the kind of connective tissue between people getting politicized around certain issues but seeing themselves as kind of siloed into whatever issue they're being politicized in, um, and this young base of, of now just 60,000, um, uh, 65,000 young socialists in DSA um, to try to recreate some of these uh, networks and, and, and connections. Um, so uh, I'll wrap up with kind of a concrete example of what this has um, looked like um, recently. So in 2015, 2016, the Sanders campaign won all 55 counties in West Virginia. West Virginia was formerly, many, many years ago, a hotbed of labor radicalism, but it's since kind of drifted in a very conservative direction. But all 55 counties of West Virginia in the Democratic primaries vote for Bernie Sanders as opposed to Hillary Clinton. So vote for, for, the, for the by far most left-wing uh, candidate. Now, the infrastructure, all his volunteers in these 55 states, a lot of them, particularly a group of teachers in all 55 counties, stayed politicized and stayed connected. So many of them joined, uh, uh, well first, I must say, they joined a Jacobin reading group with some of them, uh, and they read this book, Class Action, this teacher pamphlet we did. Um, uh, then they joined uh, DSA, Democratic Socialist of America chapter. And then when there began to, to grow grievances about pay, wages, the conditions for their students, and so on, these public sector teachers, these grievances were not the grievances of socialists. These were mass grievances of teachers, many of whom voted for Donald Trump or weren't particularly uh, politicized. But the role of the socialists, who had stayed connected after being politicized by the Bernie Sanders campaign and then had their radicalism deepened by engagement with, with DSA and the surrounding networks, was to be able to form the core of the cadre that were connecting the different uh, uh, walkouts in the different counties, that were giving some sort of broader history and context to what was going on, who were saying, well, you know, your grandfather was part of this mass um, um, uh, wave of strikes that happened in the 30s and 40s. This is part of the story of our state. They were able to create this wider narrative and history and build this consciousness into a really incredible long and, and an ultimately successful strike, which became a class-wide phenomenon, not just a narrow st uh, strike of, of certain workers in, in one, one sector, in part because they um, made the demand for a 5% raise for not just themselves, but for all public sector uh, workers, even though uh, it was just primarily the teachers, the educators that were on, on strike. So I think this is an example of what socialists can do in the short term. We can play a vital role as the cadre of uh, building and politicizing um, uh, uh, people. We could turn these broader, much broader um, phenomenons like Corbyn and Sanders um, and make sure that there's some sort of permanent organizations and institutions um, left over. Uh, and that's my biggest fear, of course, about this, this moment, the Corbyn moment. Um, in a major way might be over, for all we know, um, a month and a half from now. The Sanders moment might be over by June or July. Uh, and then what happens um, you know, after to all these people who are politicized? More likely than not, they'll just drift away from, from politics. Um, and the reason why people would drift away from politics and why people have been, I was using depoliticized and apolitical before, but what I, I don't mean to say is that people are dumb or don't realize they're being oppressed or exploited. People in contexts today all across the advanced capitalist world are not in revolt like they used to be, not because they are dumb, but because they are smart. 
If you're in a condition with 8, 9, 10% unemployment, if you're in a sector that seems to be in decline, if you're working for a firm that is moving jobs overseas or not reinvesting their profits, um, uh, or are just claiming to be squeezed, or maybe are, are, sque are squeezed by, by new economic conditions, it makes perfect sense that if your boss were to go to you and say, you need you to accept the pay cut of one-fifth, or a um, hour reduction of one-third, um, to say, well, this isn't good, but it's better than not having a job at all, and to keep your head down and to look for help in civil society from your friends, from your family, uh, from your church networks, or whatever else, this would be the, a rational response given the context. And a rational response, especially in a country like the United States, where most workers are not unionized, where there is not much of a visible left, where before Bernie Sanders, it was the furthest left you could go on the political spectrum was a Bill Clinton type, not even social democrat, not even really social liberal. The more rational response wouldn't be, okay, in this context, we're gonna go on strike or we're gonna organize something or, or whatever, whatever else. So our goal as socialists, fundamentally, from this period of defeat, I think, is to, one, keep in mind our, our, our goal, um, our vision of the future, which is a world after capitalism, a world in which there's no oppression, there's no exploitation, where we're able to, in a rational way, um, plan the commanding heights. I don't want to get into the debate about what role for markets. I think, I, I, I write about it in my book, I think some role for markets, but only for consumer goods, maybe. But anyway, again, another tangent, born from sleep deprivation. Um, two, I think that we need to, beyond just looking at this, this, this um, horizon, we need to fight for immediate demands that are close to people's hearts, which means, I think, fundamentally focusing on a bread and butter of issues. And bread and butter issues don't just mean, okay, we need to just focus at the point of production on, on wages. It means saying and framing things as a matter of livelihoods and, and freedom and autonomy, as opposed to framing it in terms of a culture war. So for example, even the struggle for reproductive rights in the United States, this is often seen by liberals as a culture war issue. Well, we believe in this because we have these high-minded values and conservatives, the conservative 40% of the country, 45% of the country, don't believe in these rights because they're, they're uh, socially reactionary or they're tied to these right-wing evangelical churches and so on. As opposed to saying, and framing the term like a lot of the most radical wings of the abortion rights movement have in the US, which is that this is a, an issue that disproportionately affects poor and working class women who don't have access to clinics nearby, who have to pay exor exorbitant costs to have access to abortions, who um, are going to uh, find a way to terminate a pregnancy anyway, but are now forced to do it in unsafe conditions because clinics have been closed for 60 miles near to where they live, and so on and so on. There's one way of talking about it that speaks, I think, to the question of class, and there's a way of talking about it that speaks to the question of culture. And the way of talking about it this, that speaks to this and, and every other issue, from anti-racism to the rights of, of immigrants and refugees, there's, I think, a, a tendency as we become in this period of defeat and depoliticization and become demoured, demoured from uh, this working class subject of just merely making it about um, culture um, and making this about uh, kind of a, a battle that, is, that contrasts um, you know, forms of uh, traditional uh, left-wing emphasis on uh, the working class as a as a agent of change, and contrast that with uh, caring about other issues, uh, uh, anti-oppression um, uh, politics, and so on. So I think one of our goals has to be to reintegrate uh, these struggles into the the lens of, of of class, and not either go to the the extreme of dis dismissing it and um, ceding ground to the to the right by um, 
by changing kind of our stance on these issues or by backtracking on our commitment to um, the free movement of people and so on. Um, but to um, uh, do this in a way where we're, we're, we're still uh, talking about an actual agent of, of uh, change. Because uh, fundamentally, the working class has changed, but it's still the group that has power at the point of production. And the United States, I think what we've managed to do with recent campaigns, like the teacher strike, is to foreground our subjects. In this case, it's going to be different than the old, um, most important parts of the working class. Or in our imaginary, we would think about the dock worker, the auto worker, as, as the, the, the parts of production with the most leverage. Today it would be maybe the nurse, the teacher, the logistics worker working at a, a warehouse. But to still remember that there are parts of the working class that have greater power and greater leverage. And these parts of the working class need to be at the center of our strategic agenda in order to create a broader program that uses them to create a program that protects the most marginalized. And this question of social weight, this question of we all have the same moral worth, but we're not all equal from a strategic standpoint, has been basically lost. And it's only now, at least in the United States, in the last couple of years, we've, we've been able to, uh, to talk about this, move away from just merely moralistic conceptions of, of, um, of, of politics that sees perhaps the linchpin of our politics as being uh, around the most marginalized and the more, most oppressed, as opposed to the most powerful, um, whose interests are not counterposed, but in fact uh, work um, you know, very well together with the interests of the, the most oppressed. So I guess I should turn to um, two questions. So I hope at least you glean something from, from that. Um, I uh, am still very tired, but I have maybe 20 minutes left in me. Um, so I, I guess, yeah. OK, then we can, I can collect some uh, questions. And, and you memorize or take notes. OK. Is there any questions? Take this first. I was wondering about this, um, you're saying this is the Jeremy Corbyn moment or this is the Bernie Sanders moment, and you have a much more individual political scene in the US, for example. We do not choose uh, persons, we choose uh, political parties. And uh, when you uh, sort of pin your political success on one person, um, isn't that a risky kind of thing? Isn't it better to have the movement and to have the sort of um, standpoint and it isn't about sort of competing first in the primaries, I suspect, and then later on, and then not building the movement in the way you could do? That is my, f my one question, yeah. Should I do my question too? Yeah, so Baskar, you're a uh, founding uh, uh, person of uh, the Jacobin magazine, uh, which is super successful in the way that it talks to a lot of people, but still keeps that radical uh, content. So I'm, I want to ask you about how do you build uh, a, a medium of left-wing politics, uh, like a magazine? Because also here in Sweden, we all only have one major left magazine, which is etc., and it's still... It's not a left-wing, uh, purely magazine, but it's a, like the Green Party or the Social Democratic Party. So what are the main things to think about if you want to build left-wing uh, power in the media? We live in, in kind of a paradox right now in the Western world where most of the people support socialist measures or politics like, you know, free healthcare for everyone, better public transportation, and so on. And still, left parties don't seem to be able to grasp power and introduce those measures. How do you explain that? Uh, if possible, what is your opinion of the 
situation in Sweden about uh, our left party, Vänsterpartiet. Yeah, so, um, yeah, let, let me take, uh, take those, okay. All right. Um, so, um, when it comes to, well, I, I think that in our traditional um, uh, time of left advance, uh, and let's focus, I, I will focus here on European social democracy because transposing things to the US context is actually very difficult. Because um, in the United States, at times we have had a socialist movement, and at times we have had a labor movement, like a, a pretty militant workers movement, and it, but at no point do we ever had the, the merger of the two. Uh, whereas in large parts of Western Europe, for instance, there were decades in which you had the merger of the two. So for example, in Germany, in the um, uh, 1860s, you could say there was the beginning of a workers' movement. Uh, then later on, there was a growth of a ideological kind of currents of socialists. But by the 1890s and, and the first decade of the, the 20th century, you could say that there was a socialist workers' movement. And you could um, speak of them as one and the same. So today, often in our language, right, when we talk about movements, um, we talk about the ideological kind of socialist left, we talk about social movements, we talk about workers, and we talk about them as kind of separate, separate things, whereas you know, at various points there has been a class, um, a united uh, class movement, and that's never been the case in the US. Um, but when um, both European social democracy and European left parties were at their peak, um, one, the, the system here, I mean, shouldn't be different than, than, um, than in the UK as far as, because uh, in the UK, only uh, a couple, like 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people are going to vote directly for, for Jeremy Corbyn, you know, just his constituency. Uh, the rest are voting for various Labour Party um, MPs. Um, but a lot of the messaging in the UK, Labour Party, Labour Left, has been around this one candidate and his program and his agenda, and who are the MPs that are with his Labour Left agenda, and who are the MPs hostile to it. And I still think that's basically a strategy that, that should work. Um, and what I meant to essentially say is that um, we are in an era now of, of mass media and communications and things like that that I think also fuel a more personalized uh, vision of, of people wanting to have uh, a figure as to, as to associate with ideas. Whereas before, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the most important thing was uh, who your shop steward was telling you to vote for. Um, there used to be block, in the UK, there used to be block precinct captains where like literally every tenement um, building had a Labour Party block precinct, and you would knock on the door, you would know your MP, you would drink at the pub with your MP. You know, this was part of a, a web of working class uh, culture and politicization that has all but um, vanished. Um, so I, I, I think the best way to answer your question is that we shouldn't make a virtue out of necessity, um, certainly. But I don't see how necessarily having um, a couple very prominent leaders, like in the in the UK, having Jeremy Corbyn and, and John McDonald, and to a lesser degree, um, Pitcock and, and Diane um, Abbott, and, and people like this, be the faces of a, of a current, um, need necessarily be uh, bad for, for movements. I think, in fact, it's actually been good in the, the UK to have these galvanizing figures. In other cases, uh, like in France, for instance, I think having um, a single a uh, galvanizing, impressive figure uh, that has um, essentially uh, an excessive focus on electoral campaigning has been bad for, um, for movements uh, of the left in France, for instance. So I think it's just a, a matter of uh, how, you, how you do it and what you're building. And whether the activists are, are embracing popular rhetoric in a mass way or they're embracing populism in the, in the worst ways, right? So I guess, I guess that distinction is, is difficult to make, but the populist mistake would be to say, we have our leader and our leader is pure. And because our leader is pure and connects directly with the people, we don't need mediating structures between our leader and the people. 
and our leader will be able to cut through all the web of institutions and be able to get things done for the people. But that is not a Marxist or socialist conception of change. Um, but to say that we have this great leader and he needs you and you're gonna build these movements, these institutions, and he's gonna be held to democratic, or she's gonna be held to democratic account through um, uh, party structures and with this combination of class power, the grassroots that we're building, and uh, wise, democratically accountable leadership, we're gonna cut through uh, institutional malaise and we're gonna defeat our class enemy. You know, that's, that's a socialist conception of, of change. So, I mean, the, I think there is a, a, a difference between uh, the two. Uh, in the US, we're often forced into a more populist position because we simply don't have a party and we don't have structures, so we have to. Um, so, um, Jacobin Magazine, I mean, what we do is simple in part because uh, there's 330 million people in the US. Um, there's, what, like 60 million people in the UK, you know, so it's a big language market. And our model is just based around getting a huge amount of web traffic, uh, then converting a small amount of those people into subscribers. So we have 2 million, you know, visitors every month, and then we convert maybe 50, 60,000 of them into paid subscribers, which pays our staff and our writers, and then we use our staff and our writers to generate more web content, which generates more traffic, which we convert into subscribers. So my actual model, I think, is not, I don't think I have advice for smaller language markets. I'm not sure if it'll work. Um, like, we don't take large foundation fundings. We have never gotten any state support, except we have a slight subsidy um, for um, postage. The US Post Office still does a legacy, the old 19th century kind of Republic of Letters thing um, that they'll probably get rid of one day. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I'm not sure I have, I have uh, advice in, in any sort of way that applies to uh, smaller um, language markets. Um, sorry, it wasn't a very political answer. Um, and I would say as far as this paradox, I think it is very interesting the fact that people um, you know, obviously um, know that they're getting a raw deal and obviously want certain things and obviously like certain parts of our, of our program, but end up um, uh, not engaging with it and not voting. And I think the main problem is we need to actually galvanize people to get to the point where they go from dropping out of the political process to voting. Um, there's been a lot of mythology uh, I think excessively emphasizing those former uh, left and social democratic voters who started voting for the, for the right. Um, but in most countries, it's just people um, no longer um, vote. And in part, they're voting uh, because they know that voting won't make a lot of difference. And th they know, uh, I think instinctively, that the left project that was delivering improvements in their lives I, I stopped delivering improvement in their lives and it's not clear that it, it will deliver improvements in their lives in the, in the future. So I think developing, uh, it's kind of, that is you know, the definition of a paradox because we need to uh, develop the class forces that allow us to create a new program, even if it's just in the short term a class struggle social democratic program that can deliver real gains, uh, but people need real gains delivered before they'll be convinced that politics um, you know, will, will change things in their, in their life. But I think the root of the problem is just the fact that collective action is very difficult. Um, capitalists don't need to be organized. So in Sweden, capitalists have always been, or have been very organized, but when did they become uh, very organized? What's your employer federation, SAF, uh, whatever, or whatever it was, it was the SAF, right? Um, but, it w but the employer's federation was formed as a, a and was enlarged and took on kind of an increased consciousness and coordination. Why? Because it was responding to uh, the LO, it was responding to sectoral bargaining. It was responding to proposals like the, um, like the wage earner fund proposal, like the Meidner plan. It, it was forced into a degree of uh, coherence. But in most countries, capitalists don't need to coordinate because they're all producing for the market and they're all trying to cut costs and they all have the same incentive behind pay their workers as low as possible and deregulate as much as possible. Neoliberalism didn't come about because of Milton Friedman or the Chicago School, because it came about because capitalists knew that their profitability was declining and they needed to figure out ways to restore their profitability. Um, but organizing workers is basically impossible. You need to take people's 
uh, uh, interests and aggregate them together. Um, uh, then you need to do that, when you do that on a shop floor, you need to do that across a sector. Uh, then you need to do it um, across sectors. And all this, I think, makes it basically, um, um, it makes collective action the exception rather than the rule. So my question is never, where's the left? Why aren't workers in revolt? My question is kind of mostly, wh why, wh why are workers in revolt when they are revolt, in, uh, why, when they are? in that exception, and what can we do to make collective action more viable? And that's, I think, the role of all of us in this room. It's not to impart consciousness or knowledge onto people. It's to create the conditions in which collective action could be a more viable choice uh, for, for people. And I think that kind of gets at what, how we uh, get people to, 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 um, to vote. But we need this conscious militant minority in the working class and among socialist activists, that I think, to be the spark not to win socialism, but to create that condition where, where people can, can latch on and make, make change. Uh, and I guess I should, uh, I have two minutes. Uh, that last question, oh, what are, what are my impressions of the left party in Sweden? Well, first of all, I just got here. I'm a good guest. I haven't been given a meal yet, so I gotta be nice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, my, my impression is it is a major achievement the left party in, in, um, in Sweden, Die Linke in, in um, Germany, these wave of, of, um, of parties, even if they are stuck um, and not, not at the stuck at 9, 10% you know, across much of Europe, there was the real risk of having the left wiped out. So maintaining a stable base and maintaining the ideas of the left, the goals of socialism, I think is, is an incredible uh, achievement, given how thorough um, our defeat, um, the working class defeat, uh, could have could have been, um, and I, I think that obviously, from there, um, actually um, winning power and bringing about a program is very is very uh, difficult. And I guess the debate that you would um, have to have to have is to to figure out what kind of, um, what will be the spark and what will be the type of, of change that will, um, that will make change in, in Sweden? Will it be um, uh, the combination of a rising, growing, uh, more prominent uh, left party with a re-radicalization of a wing of the Social Democratic Party? Or will it be something completely new? Um, will, it, will, it, will it actually ta have to take on kind of a, in the best sense of the world, a more left populist uh, kind of inflection and do away um, with with um, uh, you know that 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 might be that's that's I don't know enough about the context to say I would say for example in Germany there's no hope of change within the SPD um, the SPD needs to be uh, kind of washed away unfortunately I, it pains me to to say uh, which means that it'll have to be delinking some sort of much broader current of unpoliticized people that that aren't currently voting for, for any party of the, the left, some sort of uh, left populist change plus the, the core base of the, the left um, to make change there. I don't know enough about the contemporary context here. I stopped paying attention to Sweden in the 19, late 1980s. You know. Um, you know, um, I imagine it'll be easier to make change in, in Norway. They have oil. I don't know. So uh, uh, you all should talk to me after we could we could chat and I could you know learn more about the context here. But uh, thank you all for for coming and I guess I should let you wrap up for. Yeah. Asking I, questions. First of all.